West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Always good to talk to you. Good to be with you, Jim. All right, top of minds for many parents today. Kids are going back to school. Many have been back in school for a couple of weeks now. Uh, how much should we expect an increase in infections among children under 12, not yet vaccinated, as they go back to school, particularly in many states where they're not even allowed to, to, to require masks, for instance, in school? How concerned are you? All right. Well, that's the issue that you just mentioned, Jim. If we do things right, we hope that we don't see much increase at all. If we want to protect the children, particularly those who are not yet eligible for vaccination, you want to surround the children with people who are vaccinated, teachers, school personnel, everyone else. But also, in order to protect those who can't get vaccinated, there are certain simple things you have to do. You mentioned one of them universal masking in the school. And even though there are you know, some government leaders locally who are trying to push back on that, we've got to get the school system masked in addition to surrounding the children with, that, with vaccinated people. That's the solution. We don't need to see a big uptick at all in cases if we do it right. The trouble is, as you know, politi- politics still trump the science, right? Uh, you, you listen, for instance, to the governor of Florida, one of the states, of course, that has banned mask mandates. The, the way he described vaccinations was was really remarkable and, again, defies the science. I, I want to play it now, just describing who the vaccine is, is for. Have a listen. I want to get your reaction. The, the vaccines have helped people ward off severe illness. Um, and you know, we obviously work very hard to distribute it. At the end of the day, though, it is what somebody, it's about your health and whether you want that protection or not. It really doesn't impact uh, me or anyone else. That's false. Please explain to folks listening Absolutely. right now why that's false. Well, I mean, I, I didn't hear him very well for, from the sound, but I mean, if he feels that vaccines are not important for people, that they're, they're just important for some people, that's, in, that's completely incorrect. Vaccination, Jim, has been the solution to every major public health issue in which a vaccine was developed for. I mean, smallpox, polio, measles. Yeah. I'm not sure what people are talking about when they push back on vaccinations. It is historically, over decades and decades and decades, shown to be the way you control an infectious disease. Beyond that, let me to clarify, his point at the end there was to say, it's just a personal choice about yourself. It doesn't impact anybody else. Explain why that's just not true. Yeah. Well, well, that's not true at all. I mean, obviously, it's important for you as an individual for your own personal protection, safety and health. But when you have a virus that's circulating in the community and you are not vaccinated, you are part of the problem because you're allowing yourself 
to be a vehicle for the virus to be spreading to someone else. So it isn't as if it stops with you. If that were the case, then it would be only about you. But it doesn't. You can get infected even if you get no symptoms or minimally symptomatic and then pass it on to someone who in fact might be very vulnerable, an elderly person, a person with an underlying disease. So when you're dealing with an outbreak of an infectious disease, it isn't only about you. There's a societal responsibility that we all have. Sad fact is a lot of folks aren't making choices based on that science or that responsibility to others in their community. We have the Delta variant. Uh, it has been leading to an increased number, not just of infections, but, but crucially deaths. Do you anticipate that, that in the coming weeks that will tail off at all, that, that the fall will be worse? Or is it possible it might be better, that, that, that those, those increases, we'll see those graphs kind of, kind of come off these peaks? Well, Jim, it could go either way, and it's up to us. We have the capability within our own selves, our own decision-making process, as to whether or not we want it to go in the direction of diminution. And we can do that because we have the tool to do it. We have about 75 million people in this country who are eligible to be vaccinated, who are not yet vaccinated. If we get the overwhelming majority of those people vaccinated, we could turn this around even as we go into the cooler weather of the fall. We can do it. It's within our grasp. Let me ask you this, because beyond that question of getting the portion of the population, about a quarter to, to this point, who, who is still not uh, vaccinated, you now have this question of for the vaccinated, when uh, and how urgently they may, might need a, a third shot. I mean, we're moving in that direction. Uh, my question is, will it become that this is really not so much a two-dose vaccine, right, a Pfizer or Moderna, but, but really a three-dose? That, that in other words, you will need that third shot, that booster, to be truly protected from this virus. Right. I think the latter, Jim. I mean, as, I mean given the experience I've had over many years with vaccines, it looks very much like it isn't as if two doses of a vaccine are failing. It's that the proper regimen will very likely, as we look back on it months from now, will be that three doses is really what you should be getting of an mRNA. That might be two doses for a J and J. But for the mRNA, we know from studies that are already ongoing in Israel now that when the degree of protection against infection and even severe disease goes down to a certain precarious level, when you give the person that third boost, you dramatically increase the level of protection, even more so than before the boost. It goes up to and beyond the level of protection. So, I mean, I believe strongly that ultimately we are going to see that as the proper regimen, three doses of an mRNA. And that's a good point you just made there, that that third dose makes you even more protected as an incentive. Trouble, of course, has been some mixed messaging, some movement of the timeline on when that third dose will, will be fully uh, approved. I know you have said that you still believe by the week of September 20th or close uh, that, that the White House will be able to move forward on its plan for booster shots. But, but governors, understandably frustrated about some of this guidance. Have a listen. I want to get your reaction. We've got people that are well beyond six months that are 60 and older that need the booster shot. And we can't give it to them because we're being held up by, you know, the nation and, and on the federal level right now. We need clear guidance on these booster shots because it, it un undermines, uh, you know, cr the credibility of it. When, in your best guess, well, not just governors, but folks watching right now know exactly when and what boosters they will get and should get. Well, we're still aiming for the week of September the 20th. It would have been optimal to get, at least with the mRNAs, to get both Pfizer and Moderna to roll out the booster program at the same time simultaneously. It looks now it is possible and I think likely that you will see Pfizer get ruled out, uh, get, get rolled out first because the data that they submitted to the FDA. Remember, you, you've got to get approval. All of this, Jim, and we've said that from the very beginning, is contingent on the FDA regulatory approval and the recommendation of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices to the CDC. 
Pfizer has gotten those data into the FDA. They're going over it now. I think they're going to be on time. Moderna may be a bit behind, but not much. So I think that you're going to get both of them out. They may not be absolutely simultaneously, but it's going to be close. By the end of this month? I would hope so. I think they'd probably end no more than a couple of weeks behind, if that much. Okay. Uh, big picture. There's a question now, right? You're familiar with this, about is there a point where we begin to live with COVID-19 to some degree, that, that it becomes less of a pandemic response, more of what's known as an endemic response. In other words, it's one of many, though, severe diseases, infections we live with. Uh, are we reaching that point? I think we're going to get there. And as I said before, to, to an answer to one of your other questions, Jim, we will get there depending on how successfully we vaccinate our population. If we get more people vaccinated, we really give a big dent into that 75 million people who are eligible but not vaccinated. We will turn this around from the standpoint it will no longer be an outbreak. It will be there. You're not going to completely eradicate it. But right now we are in outbreak mode. We have 160,000 infections per day. That's pandemic. We can get that way, way down. We may not get rid of it completely. You may see intermittent cases that'll come and break through, which will be manageable. It will not interfere with our lives. It will not be a public health threat. Yeah. How soon we get there is dependent on us. Yeah. It's how soon we get those people vaccinated who are not vaccinated. It is Tuesday, the 7th of September of 2021. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. A small scant dash. Uh-huh. A mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika. Will make all the difference in the world. It does. In fact, I used some just yesterday on a lovely dish. Well, uh, you know, it was River City Hash Monday, so what was left over from the weekend? Mm -hmm. Even though it was a holiday. That was just the brunch item. Anyway, enough of that. How are you? We're uh, getting through this week. Uh, a lot of news and events happening here and around the world. Wow, what's up with Brazil? Bolsonaro pulling out a little Trump insurrection on January 6th plan, huh? Boy, uh, looks like they're going after a particular Supreme Court justice. The maggot, well, they don't call it maggots there, but whatever Bolsonaro's group is, they're like maggots. Uh, the types of insurrectionists that stormed the Capitol on January 6th, that's, that's the ilk that are doing Bolsonaro's bidding. And they've surrounded the area where this one Supreme Court justice who has been a, shall we say, a critic of Bolsonaro. And there's some speculation that his life may be in grave danger. And I think that speculation might uh, bear fruit because he is. Just like our electeds were in grave danger. But I, it could be, uh, you never know. <laughs> you never know. This crowd could overwhelm the security forces there. And, um, you know, similar fashion, what happened on January 6th, except this guy, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I think it's uh, this is a playbook that's going to be played out many more times. In fact, it's going to happen again here in the United States of America. That's right. And uh, we could say that, uh, you know, this bottom up strategy that Bannon, you know, it's nothing new. Jesus, get your dog catcher elected and let's take over this government. You got to start somewhere. So, you know, I mean, school boards have traditionally been the way to go when you're advancing a political agenda and getting people ready to be elected to office and whatnot. You know, you put them through their paces, get on the school board. And so um, that's what uh, that's what Bannon has suggested. And they put together a strategy 
and was to do this on a micro level. So uh, why don't we? <laughs> yes, I know. Why don't we? Their idea, though, is not necessarily to get elected, but to terrorize the people that are already sitting on these boards and city councils, run them off, get them to quit, and then you get your people in there. And Well, you know, next thing, <laughs> you'll have armed sentries making sure that you're acting the way you are supposed to act. Welcome to America. And they call it freedom. They do. <laughs> and you know it's not. We all know it's not. That's why it's so disconcerting. It's hard to believe it can happen here. Yes, it can happen here. I keep telling everybody the Nazis learned how to be Nazis by studying American white supremacists. Jeez, didn't come out of a vacuum. Nope. And you would expect the Germans, with their engineering skills, to be able to, you know, deconstruct it all and then put it back together and figure it out and make it better. <laughs> better? <laughs> More efficient? Uh-huh. They synthesized it, so it became a very workable machine. Quite efficient. Uh-huh. So, just saying, maybe we ought to look at ourselves a bit. Oh, no, we can't do that. We have to deny the fact that we've been psychopathic murderers in the whole existence of our history. Ooh, no, don't, don't want to confront that. Might make us uh, psychopathic. <laughs> make us depressed. Really? Maybe you should be then. If it's a moderating principle on your behavior and moral code, jeez. I used to think that guilt and all that kind of stuff was wrong, but maybe it's a, maybe it should be done. I know we shouldn't do it out of peak because that's not necessarily a humane way of dealing with it. But I'm pissed off. <laughs> it's about time these these scaff laws, delinquents, uh, you know, learn some tough love. Tough love. I don't know. Spanking's not going to be the way that moderates their behavior. They'll be like any petulant child. Oh, just hit me and get it over with. And go out there and continue doing what it was. You're trying to get them to stop when you hit them. Don't hit them. <laughs> Make them sit in a corner. Or, you know, isolate them. Ground them. You know, whatever it takes. And that will be a moderating principle, too. I used to think that, uh, you know, if there was a transgression... That my son, when he was just a little guy, you know, he has to take a toy out and he has to donate it to a, like a shelter or, you know, Goodwill or St. Vincent de Paul or something. And I, I sort of registered that rather than moderating his behavior, he, he began to sort of dislike St. Vincent de Paul and Goodwill because they were taking his toys. <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped that. Oops, I uh, wasn't quite imparting the uh, lesson I wanted to impart. <laughs> I guess you would call that transference. They're trying to figure it out. We all are. So, uh, yeah, what's the moderating principle on these delinquents' behavior? What do you do? Do you take away their toy? I don't know. Probably won't be good enough. And it might impart the wrong lesson. <laughs> Though I do like the idea of asset, civil asset forfeiture of their monster trucks and all those boats. Jesus Christ, how do they get the money for those boats? Because they have economic anxiety and they got to hoard what they can get and steal it if they can't get it any other way. And they do. <laughs> Not all of them. Yes, they're tax cheats, too. Everybody wants to be a tax cheat. That's the way to success. Yeah, you're not an American unless you're cheating on your taxes. Trump went out there and 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 boasted about it. Well, that makes me smart, not you, because I don't pay my taxes. Ah, you're a crook. <laughs> Get over it. And the sooner that all of us, and I mean these maggot idiots too, admit that Trump is a well, I take it back. They don't care. In fact, they look at 
at it as as a glorifying uh, thing to glory. Oh, he's a crook. He's our crook. Look, he's kicking it to the libs. All right. If that's the only thing that's important to those types, then, um, well, maybe they do need to be stood in the corner. And speaking of Bannon, <laughs> God, why? I still don't understand why this guy is not in jail. Why is he not in a brig? He has attacked the United States of America. He has sent shock troops. He is a mastermind of this BS. I say that you, the United States government should buy that Italian castle that Bannon wanted to buy to have his... I don't know, right-wing fascist uh, university. And the Italian government said, hell no, you know, in Italian. And uh, they wouldn't sell it to him. Well, why don't we buy it? And we can give him what he wants, except we'll make that, well, maybe we'll make it a black site. And we'll chain him to the walls and the dungeon of this castle. Maybe waterboard him regularly, put him on the rack. Until he tells us what we want to know. You know, tit for tat. Works for them, might work for us. But then, all kidding aside, what does that make us? Do we descend into the madness that they have descended into and, and habitate? Habitate? <laughs> Habituate? Habituate? No. <laughs> they live in... <laughs> Do we devolve to that? Or is there no need to devolve because we're already there? These are all questions that are philosophical considerations that they don't want to teach you in the school because once you start considering it, well, you might get depressed. Too bad. Oh, boy. Okay, well, it's only Tuesday and we're already uh, way past Descartes. <laughs> way past. Why don't we get into the more curated aspects of this uh, salon that we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy as we start off in the Bistro Cafe. At the top, yes, Dr. Anthony Fauci pushed back on a claim by DeSantis that unvaccinated individuals have no impact on others. Mm -hmm. They don't teach empathy. Actually, you know, you're, it's, it's like you're either a sprinter or you're not. You're either equipped with the literature, lit ligament, ligature, yeah, the uh, muscle uh, connections to be able to be a sprinter or not. And maybe it's a, empathy is the same thing. You know, I've considered that. You, you don't really learn empathy. You're either empathetic or you're not. And um, they have no idea what empathy is. This is what we're confronted with. And I'm sorry, uh, DeSantis is a, well, mass murderer, and Ian Abbott of Texas. You know, they ought to be in jail. At least sitting in the Hague awaiting trial. I wish we would become part of the world court. A lot would change if we were able to be so. Anyway, on the rest of the menu, shortages of supplies and workers will delay Gulf rebuilding. Well, it always does. Right after a hurricane and all sorts of other uh, natural disasters, you know, like a worldwide pandemic. That's why it's a pandemic. It's worldwide. The Minnesota State Patrol purged emails and text messages immediately after protest over the death of George Floyd last year. Yeah, when they were confronted with the facts that, uh, you know, discovery was being uh, uh, imposed because they beat the crap out of the press and did all sorts of illegal things. We're going to hide it, but they're emails. And a prominent South Carolina lawyer was shot and hurt months after his wife and son were slain. Ooh, gossip in South Carolina. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Germany lodged a protest against Russia over its attempts to steal data from the country's lawmakers right before an election, too. Sound familiar? And the U.N.'s top climate official warned that no country is safe from global warming. That's why it's global.
All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. You know, I never mentioned the fact that there is a live player at the top of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. It's the button, it's right there at the top, very big. So if you're not listening to there and you're having trouble on other uh, platforms, uh, try our homepage at netrootsradio.com. Now, also near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the left of the chat room link is the link to our Patreon site. And yes, everything costs money, and that's why we are mentioning the fact that we have a Patreon site in which you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio and help us in fulfilling our civic duty that the uh, founders originally intended, oh, so many years ago, and uh, we uh, take our uh, civic duty quite seriously. But the infrastructure, you know, the, the bill paying uh, can be a bit daunting. And we are, well, I just got to admit, we need help and always have. <laughs> Even though we take out of our own pockets a lot of money to be able to keep this thing afloat, we need your help as well. And if you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink, or how about a cocktail? If you could afford a cocktail and send the money uh, from that to us once a month, uh, we convert that almost like transubstantiation. Uh huh. We turn those spirits into currency in which we can then pay these bills, fly under the radar because that technology is still in use, and continue this powerhouse of resistance against forces arrayed against the destruction of the great experiment. And uh, we thank you for. Well, allowing us to do so. Thank you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. And thank you, Tom, for doing so and, and a lot of other stuff, too. All right. And I am at Justice Putnam on Twitter. I post the show notes and links diary, incidentally on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime, and then try to get that uh, uh, linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. Sometimes uh, during the, uh, the, the news clip at the top of the show. I'd like to do it before the show even starts, but you know how things go. There's a mad scramble before all the switches are actually completely well turned. Switched. <laughs> You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And please do, please, please, please pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes. And really, wherever you can get podcasts, we're there. Everywhere. All righty. This uh, first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press. And uh, the journalists putting this together are Paul Wiseman and Alex Vega. Joe Sobel, owner of Big Easy Construction in New Orleans, has bad news for homeowners who've been calling about roofs damaged by Hurricane Ida or to get an update on renovations that were scheduled before the storm ripped through the area. The job will cost a lot more than usual and take much longer, too. That's right. Ida slammed into the Gulf Coast, then took its destruction to the north and the east, at a time when building contractors were already grappling with severe shortages of workers and depleted supply chains. The damage inflicted by Ida has magnified those challenges. The struggle to find enough skilled workers and materials will likely drive up costs, complicate planning, and delay 
reconstruction for months. The challenges facing construction companies stem from what happened after the nation endured a brutal but brief recession when the viral pandemic erupted in March of 2020. The economy rebounded far faster and stronger than anyone expected. Businesses of all kinds were caught off guard by a surge in customer demand that flowed from an increasingly robust economic recovery. Workers and supplies were suddenly in short supply. For months now across the economy, businesses have been scrambling to acquire enough supplies, restock their shelves, and recall workers that had furloughed during the recession. Construction companies have been particularly affected among building executives. Zonda surveyed last month. That must be a construction uh, uh, survey company. Zonda. 93% complained of supply shortages. 74% said they lacked enough workers, and that was before Ida struck. As a result of, uh, of that, the cost of materials and supplies has been surging. Combined prices for windows, doors, roofing, and other building products jumped 13% in the first six months of this year, according to Labor Department data. Before 2020, by contrast, such aggregate prices would typically rise a bit more than 1% annually on average in the first six months of a year. Prices for steel mill products were up more than twofold in July from a year earlier. Gypsum products, which are needed for drywall, partitions, ceiling tiles, and and the like, were up 22%. Ah, uh, then there's the labor shortage. Among workers in short supply are framers who build, install, and maintain foundations, floors, and door and window frames, carpenters, electricians, plumbers, and heating and air conditioning specialists. Well, in making matters worse, the power is still out in many places. Gasoline is in short supply, and the Gulf Coast weather is sweltering. And why wouldn't they be anonymous when reporting on a story like this? But anonymous worker bees from the Associated Press bring us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. The Minnesota State Patrol purged emails and text messages immediately after the protests over the death of George Floyd last year, according to testimony in a lawsuit that alleges the agency targeted journalists during the unrest. During a July 28 hearing, State Patrol Major Joseph Dwyer testified that he had he and a vast majority of the agency deleted the messages after the protests and riots, according to a transcript published last Friday on the court's docket. Attorneys for the Minnesota chapter of the ACLU said the file destruction makes it nearly impossible to track the state patrol's behavior as courts and investigators are trying to determine whether law enforcement used improper force against demonstrators. State Patrol spokesman Bruce Gordon told the Star Tribune that officers follow all requirements for retaining data and that he could not comment further due to the pending lawsuit. Oh, really? You're getting rid of the data. The purge was neither accidental, automated, nor routine. ACLU attorneys wrote in a motion asking the judge to order the state patrol to to stop attacks on journalists covering protests. The purge did not happen because of a file destruction or retention policy. No one reviewed the purge communications before they were deleted to determine whether the materials were relevant to this litigation. 
The lawsuit alleges the Minneapolis Police Department and the State Patrol used unnecessary and excessive force to suppress First Amendment rights to cover the unrest last summer. It's one of several lawsuits filed against law enforcement for alleged constitutional violations and use of force last summer. Alleged conduct, I might add, that was caught on film. Jared Goyette, a freelancer who covered the unrest for the Washington Post and The Guardian, is the lead plaintiff in the lawsuit, which says he was shot in the face with less lethal ballistic ammunition by Minneapolis police on May 27, 2020. In addition to the lawsuit, the Department of Justice is investigating the police response to protests and riots and Minneapolis is reviewing how its officers handled the unrest. I should add, less than lethal usually means, ah, you just lost an eye, shattered a jaw, lost your job, became an invalid. Staff, bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A lawyer from a prominent South Carolina legal family who found his wife and son shot to death at their home three months ago was shot in the head and wounded on Saturday after he had car trouble on a lonely rural road, a family attorney said. Alex Murdaugh was heading to Charleston when his car had stopped on the Sakahatchee Road in Hampton County. A truck passed Murdaugh on the road before turning around, and then someone in the vehicle shot him, his lawyer said. The lawyer also said he received that information from Murdaugh's brother, Randy. Murdaugh was airlifted to Medical University in South Carolina Hospital in Charleston, who uh, said Griffin, the lawyer, who did not know how many times he was shot. The State Law Enforcement Division, South Carolina's top law enforcement agency, confirmed the shooting but released no further details. Local deputy, deputies referred questions to the state police. Murdaugh, age 53, found his wife and son shot to death at their Colleton County home on June 7th, No arrests have been made, and state police have released little information, even going to court to fight public records requests. Maggie Murdaugh, age 52, and their 22-year-old son, Paul, were both shot several times and found outside the house near their dog kennels, authorities said. Alex Murdaugh said on a 911 call he had just returned home, and in a later TV interview said he was out checking on his terminally ill father when his wife and son were killed. Oh, you think it might be some sort of internecine problem? Not quite. It's much darker than this, and it looks like we have a, well, a vendetta death wish scenario going on here. Vengeance be mine? The Murdaws are one of South Carolina's most prominent legal families, Alex Murdaugh was a volunteer prosecutor in the same office where his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather spent more than 80 years combined as the area's top prosecutors. Other members of the family are prominent civil attorneys. When Paul Murdaugh was killed, the son, the 22-year-old, he was awaiting trial for boating under the influence causing death in a February 2019 crash that killed a 19-year-old woman. State police have since started looking into the investigation into that crash to see if anyone tried to keep police from charging Paul Murdaugh. 
after the Murdoch's death. State police also reopened an investigation into a 2015 hit-and-run death of a 19-year-old man in Hampton County. The victim's mother said she thought Paul Murdoch could have been involved. We'll be seeing this on a Lifetime special, I'm sure. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Mark Stratton. It was lights out and the babies were up again. Ahana Fernandez of the Natural History Museum Berlin pointed her microphone at the day roost. She was trying to catch these bat pups in full babble mode. Now normally, when we think of babbling babies, we're talking human newborns. But Fernandez was in the forest to prove something surprising, that these bat babies babble in many of the same ways humans do, despite a wide evolutionary gap between us and them. Babbling is a production milestone in human infant speech development, and it is characterized by universal features. However, evidence for babbling in non-human mammals is scarce, rendering cross-species comparisons difficult. We investigated a pup babbling behavior of wild Sacopteryx bilinata, a bat capable of vocal imitation, to compare its features to those that characterize human infant babbling. The findings are published in the journal Science magazine. The sack-winged bat is known to be particularly loquacious with a repertoire of 25 different syllable types. Fernandez has been studying the species for six years. In previous work on their language, she and her colleagues noticed that sometimes mothers spoke in a kind of pattern meant to get a response from their pups. She calls it motherese, basically a kind of baby talk aimed at their pups to guide them towards adult bat language. If you've ever been in front of a four-month-old, you yourself have probably uttered or heard someone speak in baby talk. Bat mothers, it turns out, do the same. Fernandez showed that these female sack bats heighten the pitch of their tombe and slow down their tempo to enable the pups to engage. In his current research, after studying 20 of these babbling babies in Costa Rica and Panama, the researchers identified eight speech precursors, or protophones, in the pup's babbling. Each share a parallel to that of human infants. 1. Baby bat babbling starts early in life. 2. Bouts of babbling contain combinations of adult-like sounds mixed with total gibberish. 3. Bat babies learn a smaller set of sounds that are universal to adult bat speak. 4. Eventually, adult bat words... Our syllables emerge from the babble. Five, the babies repeat the heck out of those adult bat sounds. Think of a human baby saying ba, 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 ga, 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 over and over again. Six, these repeated syllable trains get a rhythm, so bat babies speak to a beat. Seven, babies will happily talk to themselves. It only takes one for conversation in bat babble. And eight, Different colonies of babbling baby bats in Panama and Costa Rica, male and female, all babbled the same way. A long list of specifics, to be sure. But, says Fernandez, the fact that they are all there is really interesting, and not just for understanding bat speak. Human language is a very complex system requiring different cognitive abilities, for example the ability of vocal imitation. By investigating if and to what extent those abilities evolved in other species helps us to better understand the biological foundations of human language. In our case, pop babbling indicates us when vocal learning is taking place. This allows us to pinpoint the exact time window in the brain when learning processes are ongoing. 
enabling us to study the neuromolecular foundations of vocal imitation. And just like in humans, clear communication can make or break a bat's future. The research team found the first ten syllables the pups acquired were present in the complex songs that adult males used to stake their territory, all to ensure the birth of more babbling babies. The research, she says, opens the door to a better understanding of the dynamic relationship of parents and children in humans. Even though humans and bats are phylogenetically so different, they use a strikingly similar behavior to reach the same goal acquiring a large and complex vocal repertoire. Both use babbling to master the control of their vocal apparatus, enabling them to produce complex sounds and vocalizations. Studying more different babbling species, both vocal learners and non-vocal learners, will help us understand which evolutionary pressures cause babbling to be present in some species and not in others. Regardless of what other corners we may yet find babbling babies, we now know that human and bat parents share something in common. They must both rear loud, gibbering young, often in the dead of night. Thanks for listening to Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Mark Stratton. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Colorectal cancer is the number two cancer killer of men and women in the United States, but it is preventable. Early on, colorectal cancer typically has no symptoms. It starts with a precancerous polyp or abnormal growth in the colon, which can be removed without surgery. Several tests are available to find these polyps, so they can be removed before they turn into cancer. Screening also finds colorectal cancer early when treatment works best. Recommended screening for adults at average risk begins at age 50 and continues until age 75. Learn about screening test options and find out which tests are covered by insurance. Talk to your health care provider about when you should be screened and discuss the best tests for you. For more information about colorectal cancer prevention, please visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Welcome to Abortion Vigilantism in Texas. I'm Lily Ledbetter, and this is a Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. When a woman or girl is raped or is the victim of incest in Texas and becomes pregnant, she can't get an abortion. Because a Texas law, effective September 1st, prohibits any abortion after six weeks, a time when many women do not even know they're pregnant. No exceptions, not even for rape and incest. The law also makes it illegal for anyone to provide any kind of assistance to the woman considering an abortion. A father cannot counsel his daughter. A husband can't support his wife's decision, even after she was raped by a stranger. And then... The law allows any person, any person, someone with absolutely no connection whatsoever to the person needing an abortion to sue the woman and her dad, husband, sister, friend who gave her a ride to the clinic, and of course the abortion clinic itself, and receive a $10,000 award from them. $10,000! It's essentially a bounty program created by the state to hunt down women in need of medical care and those who would provide that care and support and help them. All this, notwithstanding the First Amendment's guarantee of freedom of speech and the constitutional guarantee of choice under Roe v. Wade, which this Texas law, as a practical matter, eviscerates in that state, which is, of course, its point. The legal challenges have begun. 
The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2011. That was the day hundreds of ILWU strikers blocked railroad tracks near Longview, Washington. They hoped to stop grain shipments from moving in and out of the EGT grain terminal. Longshoremen had been sitting down on the tracks throughout the summer, resulting in over 100 arrests. No trains had moved in or out of the terminal since July. But then a federal judge issued an injunction against ILWU pickets. The BNSF Railroad tried to move grain once again. ILWU picketers in Vancouver were able to hold off the train until police forcibly dispersed the crowd. Then, hundreds gathered at Longview to block the train from coming in. That's when police went on the offensive. They used clubs and pepper spray against the longshoremen, arresting 19. They threw ILWU President Bob McElrath to the ground. Rumors spread that police had broken his arm. Hundreds of regional longshoremen rushed to Longview. The Seattle and Tacoma ports shut down in protest. The next morning, 10,000 tons of grain were opened onto the railroad tracks. The grain export terminal was the first to be built in the Pacific Northwest in almost 30 years. EGT hoped to undercut the powerful ILWU, who controlled operations at the port since its founding in the 1930s. The union refused to agree to work 12-hour shifts at straight time. The EGT hoped to break the hiring hall by refusing to recognize maintenance and inside workers at the terminal. They then attempted to fill jobs with workers from the operating engineers. But the ILWU persevered. By the end of January, EGT had backed off many of its demands, negotiations resumed, and days later, the contract was signed. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon. On the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 60 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs to be a tad warmer Uh, Bumping about 97 to 98 today. Partly cloudy throughout the day with winds shifting to the west at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Partly cloudy skies tonight with lows around 60. Winds uh, out of the northwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. And then highs tomorrow about 92 except for a few afternoon clouds, mainly sunny. And winds will be out of the west northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. I should add that uh, the local uh, television stations here in southern Oregon are forecasting uh, a chance of rain more than what the weather underground here is forecasting, so we'll see how that transpires. We can only hope. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon have not been updated since their weekend uh, totals, which now Continue to stand at 189,070 folks uh, confirmed as being infected, and the deceased remain at 215 confirmed, though those totals will come in later on today, and we may have them for showtime tomorrow. Unfortunately, I expect uh, quite a few because another county had 40, 40 infections in one day. And they had over 10 deaths. Let's stop this.
Pollen is rated as none right outside the window here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is rated unhealthy for sensitive groups at 118 parts per million. Though here right now in Rogue River is not that bad. Though we will be closing up right soon. And the daytime UV index remains high as it has ticked down, as I mentioned from yesterday, to another fall total of six. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30 inches. Visibility is down to three miles. And relative humidity is at 88%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 84 and sunny. Paris is 85 and sunny. Rome is 84 and sunny. Kiev is 66 and fair. Kabul is 75 and clear. Hong Kong is 80 degrees and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 68 and mostly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 58 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 56 degrees and also partly cloudy. But New York, New York is 75 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Molson of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Germany has protested to Russia over attempts to steal data from lawmakers in what it suspects have been preparation to spread disinformation before the upcoming German election. Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Andrea Sass said that a hacker outfit called Ghost Rider has been combining conventional cyber attacks with disinformation and influence operations and that activities targeting Germany have been observed for quite some time. She said that ahead of Germany's parliamentary election on September 26, there have been attempts in using phishing emails, among other things, to get hold of personal login details of federal and state lawmakers with the aim of identity theft. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Peter de Jong and Frank Jordans of the AP bring us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The UN's top climate official urged governments to stop their deferral and delay tactics and instead embrace rapid, widespread measures to curb and adapt to global warming. Amid a season of extreme weather and new temperature records, Patricia Espinoza warned that no nation is safe from the impacts of climate change. Greece on Monday created a new ministry to address the impact of climate change following the country's worst heat wave in decades. With less than three months to go before this year's UN Climate Summit, Espinoza appealed for governments that have signed up to the 2015 Paris Accord to back what she called ambitious, Wi- rapid, widespread, transformative ep- efforts to limit global temperature rise and prepare 
for the inevitable impacts of a warming world. We better get to work, and we better get to work right now. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we're going to meet up tomorrow, of course, for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver